Hello, I'm Stan Rhodes. Welcome to our program, Drug Dependent Newborns. The babies born to drug addicted mothers are the tiniest victims of drug abuse. They enter the world literally dependent on drugs, and it's a growing problem. National numbers aren't available as yet because not all states track the number of babies born dependent to drugs. But let's look at one state that does, Florida. In Florida, 258 babies were born drug dependent in 2005. And that number was 1,374 in 2010 and grew every year in between, a 400 percent increase. Breaking it down further, in Pinellas County, Florida, which includes the cities of St. Petersburg and Clearwater, the number of babies born drug dependent more than doubled from 2008 to 2010. Well, today we're going to talk about this problem of drug dependent newborns, how it's gotten to be so bad, and what we as a society can do to prevent it. Well, three great people are with me today with all experiences of years of caring for these tiny babies and their mothers. So let me introduce them. First, Dr. Henrietta Botta is a neonatologist and the vice chair of research of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. Kay Dowdy is the vice president of Family and Community Services for Operation PAR, a substance abuse prevention, intervention, and treatment provider in Pinellas County, Florida. And Sherry Smith is the Director of Critical Care Services for East Tennessee Children's Hospital in Knoxville, Tennessee, and has spent her entire nursing career in the neonatal and pediatric settings. Well, welcome, everyone. <coughs> Heroes, really. Thank you for being on the program. Let's start with a definition. We're talking about something called neonatal abstinence syndrome. What is NAS? Uh, NAS is really a constellation of signs and symptoms that we know that, that we note on newborn babies whose mothers have used drugs during pregnancy. These, uh, these symptoms are typically what we call withdrawal symptoms because the baby has been separated from the mother and the infant has lost the uh, supply of drugs after he or she is born. When does this happen, Cherry? This happens as soon as the baby is born, actually. Within um, symptoms, seconds. Well, the, the withdrawal from the drug is happening within seconds upon birth. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is over a period of 12 to 24 hours, some babies will go as far out as 36 hours. They will begin to exhibit the signs and symptoms of withdrawal. They may be fidgety, um, inconsolable. They're, they usually have a very high-pitched cry. They're very irritable infants. Okay, are we talking about a dependency? Is it the same thing as, as being addicted? No, babies who um, uh, are withdrawing from the drugs are not addicted because when we consider addiction, we're, we're really considering choices that people make and mm -hmm. it's a conscious decision and the baby didn't have the decision. It happened because he or she their mom was taking it. So, so that's actually the beginning, isn't it? Right. So, it so is. how does this transfer from the baby, I mean from the mother to the baby? It, um, the drug is transferred during uh, fetal life when the mother consumes, um, for example, uh, painkillers. Uh, she ingests this, it goes into the circulation, goes to the placenta and goes to the baby. Now the baby will also metabolize the drug but sometimes the metabolism is uh, unpredictable. The baby may uh, keep the drugs in his or her organ systems and stay there for a while. And as the mother continues to take drugs, then they'll be, have more drugs in the baby's system. The levels would be higher. And as when the baby's born, then you cut off that supply. Mm -hmm. And so the baby will manifest uh, the withdrawal from having these drugs practically throughout fetal life. Hmm. Are we talking about something similar that we saw back in the 80s, the, the crack babies? Is this similar? It's very different from the crack babies. It's really what we're seeing now as the NAS is very similar to the heroin epidemic right. in the 60s. So back um, even further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And babies then, uh, we would see them in the nursery. They would have these tremors, irritability, and uh, diarrhea from... from um, being born to mothers who've been, who, are, who were heroin addicts. And um, heroin has the same type of um, structure, chemi chemically similar to our prescription painkillers. 
And so we are seeing similar manifestations and perhaps even worse or more severe. Sherry, is it more than just that, more than the, the painkillers? Are they stacking things? It, they are definitely stacking things. It's opioid abuse is the number one problem that we see, and those are your painkillers such as Vicodin, Percocet, those are prescription Hydrocodone, drugs. those are all prescription okay. drugs. What is happening in my unit and as I'm talking with my colleagues here is that you have polysubstance abusers. Mothers may be smoking marijuana at the same time. They may be using some cocaine, alcohol, alcohol and all of that potentiates the effect of the drug. The numbers are what is um, such a staggering thing to me and those of us that work with these babies. That I can remember when we would have very few babies that would come in that were addicted to cocaine. Today, it's not unusual to see multiple admissions in one day from this wow. substance abuse. Right here in Pinellas County, at the, the hospitals here can have over 50% of the babies um, in their neonatal intensive care units who are withdrawing, um, and they're not there for other developmental uh, problems. Uh, that is a huge number, yes, over 50%. Right, and it's, it's, it's a real issue um, that all of us are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about the prescription drug problem is that the uh, patients, uh, the moms who are using, um, it's younger and younger, and it's, it's <coughs> the uh, incidence is highest in the childbearing age. So the mothers who get pregnant, I mean, uh, and who are using tend to be women um, who are fertile. Are, are these babies, do they look normal? Uh, are they being born at full term? Depends. They're, most of them Depends. are born at least 35, 36 weeks. So they look like your normal newborn baby until they start exhibiting symptoms. Which is within moments after birth. Well, it depends on the baby. You mm -hmm. know, it's usually the there's a period of time. It's just like any, just like if we, if three of us get a cold, the three of us are going to have varying degrees of symptoms. So, babies are no different in that respect. So, um, the the um, fact of the matter is, they do exhibit it though within usually within the first 36 to 72 but, hours but of life. That can be a problem mm -hmm. because if That's the true. Um, obstetrician is unaware that the mother is using mm -hmm. uh, prescription medication um, and goes through a normal delivery. Baby looks yes. normal. Yes. She can go home on the second day before the symptomology actually begins. Yeah. And she gets home with the baby and the baby and starts the exhibiting. Right. Yes. And the babies can, I mean, moms may or may not bring them back to the hospital. And so there can be problems in that yes. as well. And to some extent, happens. the uh, onset of manifestations would depend upon when was the last time the mother was taking the medication or the, the drug. If she took it just before she delivered, and we don't know anything about it, then the baby would be fine maybe even for the next 48 or 72 hours. Right. And then after that, the baby will urinate all the drug from his or her system, and so then the baby will start having withdrawal manifestations. Mm -hmm. Now, if the baby took the drug for the last time, maybe a few days before she delivered, then you'll have an infant who's going to show withdrawal manifestations soon after mm -hmm. birth. Is there any telltale sign with the mother that you can see that, yes, she is, yes, she has taken a drug? Um, you've, you've been in this a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> what we do is we look for uh, certain characteristics that will tell us that uh, we should have a high index of suspicion that the mother is taking drugs. Number one, we try to find out whether she had uh, prenatal, prenatal care. care. <laughs> Normally, the drug using mothers will have late prenatal care or, or no or prenatal or care at, right. at all. Mm. Uh, we also look for a history of uh, what, what's happened to the other siblings. Are the other siblings staying with her mm -hmm. or were they taken away from, from, from her? So, does she have child protective services uh, um, involvement? We also find history of uh, being in the, o, in the ER for accidents where she's been ta she takes medications for pain. So you have a to be a detective as well. Oh, yes, yes, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. And sometimes mm. it's how they talk to you when you ask them questions. Mm. That, that'll um, quickly, some of the symptoms for NAS babies? The high-pitched cry, they're inconsolable. They sweat a lot 
they will claw at their skin if they will scratch themselves. They have excoriated buttocks from excessive diarrhea. They have feeding intolerance, mm -hmm. which means they can't tolerate their food or their bottle. They'll spit up or have diarrhea. Sneezing, sneezing a lot, mm -hmm. hiccuping a lot. There's yeah. a, whole, nice. a whole list of things. And sometimes, they, mm -hmm. uh, and probably more importantly, breathing problems. They breathe very fast, but yes. they're not your typical mm -hmm. baby that's having really lung problems. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they are referred to us because of, quote, tachypnea, mm -hmm. babies mm -hmm. having breathing problems. Mm -hmm. And that may just be the only sign. That's manifest. Yeah, yeah, that's manifest. Saved. I mean, they don't gradually go through, uh, you know, waking up and whatever they can be yeah, extremely, sure. I mean, asleep and then screaming. Absolutely. Well, earlier we mentioned some numbers, including the number of babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome in Pinellas County, Florida. One of the hospitals treating those babies is All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg. And recently we talked with one of their doctors about what they see every day. I've been at All Children's for going on 35 years. There's so many wonderful things that have happened in neonatology since I started. The technology, the medications. One of the things that we're really concerned about is that we're seeing many babies who are going through narcotic withdrawal at birth because we have many more of our mothers who are addicted to one or illegal or illegal narcotics and delivering babies that we have to basically tie up a hospital bed for because the withdrawal has to be treated and it has to be treated with medications that we really don't feel comfortable treating on the outside. This started in the last five years, so it's a fairly recent phenomenon, and it's growing just by astronomical numbers. Five years ago, we had maybe 20 babies with drug withdrawal. This past year, we had 169 babies admitted to our unit with drug withdrawals. And the year before that, we had a little over 100, so it's going up significantly every year. When you have such a dramatic increase to the point where at any given time, 15 to 20 percent of the babies in this nursery have the diagnosis of neonatal abstinence syndrome. It is an epidemic, and it is really an unnecessary epidemic. It's a very costly epidemic. Medically, you look at them and they look like any other baby, and you wouldn't think that they would need to be in a neonatal intensive care unit. But they can be very difficult to feed. They can be very difficult to take care of. They're very irritable. They have tremors of their hands, so their hands and feet tend to shake. They have a lot of jerky movements. They will try and get their hands to their mouths. If you put a pacifier in their mouth, they will suck frantically, um, trying to satisfy whatever urge they have. But the most obvious thing is the, the severe overstimulation of the central nervous system and the, the irritability. They have a high-pitched cry. They're very difficult to take care of until you get them under control, which is why our goal is to get them started on morphine as soon as we see that they have enough symptoms of withdrawal. If they do, we will start these babies on morphine and treat them every three hours. So with every feed, they get a dose of morphine. We keep them on the same dose once they're under control for three or four days. Then we start weaning, and we wean the dose every two days till we're able to wean the babies off. Most of our babies will spend three to four weeks in the hospital. It ties up a bed. It keeps the unit very full. You know, we're looking at trying to save money in health care, and this is one place where it would be very nice to not have these babies go through withdrawal, not have to spend time in the neonatal intensive care unit, and all of the costs that go with that. The moms, they're, they're a variety. I've, I've looked at a, a set population of 128 of our moms that came from uh, July 1st of 2010 to June 30th of 2011. About a fourth of our moms spend part of their pregnancy in jail. About half of our moms have underlying psychiatric disorders, anxiety, depression, bipolar disease. So there's a really a very diverse population. Unfortunately, a lot of moms who are doing narcotics don't get prenatal care. So they just kind of show up in labor and delivery, have a baby, or they've been told that their baby will be fine. So they come have the baby and then have to deal with the complications of withdrawal.
So is this uh, similar to what you see in your environments? That could have been my unit, except <laughs> that I am at the 50, I hit 52 percent of the beds in my neonatal intensive care unit um, just last week were neonatal abstinence syndrome diagnosis. Wow, 52 Mm percent. An unnecessary epidemic is what she said. Absolutely. Uh, What kind of money are we talking about? What is this costing? Well, it really varies. Um, You know, states have contracts with their care providers. And in Tennessee, for example, there are two companies, I think maybe three now, that will buy for the state. um, it's, It's the state contract. And you actually negotiate from hospital to hospital. It's really a difficult number to actually nail down because of the diversity of Mm -hmm. how people negotiate those contracts. But if you just think about it, if you just go back with a macro lens and look at the fact that I have a 60-bed neonatal intensive care unit and 52% of those beds are tied up with in in what I deem an unnecessary admission because... I've spent my life telling people that, and calming mothers down, you did nothing to cause your baby to have this congenital defect. There's nothing you could have done. That's not the case with this. Um, So when you look at that cost and the cost of babies that don't don't get the bed, huge cost. And that's not necessarily a dollar cost that you're talking about. No. no. I mean, in in Pinellas County, we look at about $1,000 a day. Per baby. Per baby. Sure. So, and, and the baby will be in, that's what we use on to. average, would be in that NICU unit for... Right, and it depends on the hospital because they're trying um, different cocktails as the neonatologist right. talk to, to right. do it, but it, it varies from 22, 23 days to 35, 36 days. Yes. So what kind of environment should these babies be in, ideally? A very... You've got your environment in. Right, a very... <laughs> Quiet, Quiet. Okay. non-stimuli producing environment. And that is um, exactly the opposite of what most neonatal intensive care units look like. And sound like. And sound, and sound like. like. So you have babies who are very irritable being stimulated by light, light sound, sound, alarms, people, <laughs> actions, mm. and when you have 52% NAS infants, other babies who are crying. Henrietta, do all of these babies need to be in a hospital? Can they be treated out of the hospital? Well. <laughs> is that a tough one to call? It, it, it is a tough one to call because it's not the baby, it's not just the baby that you're treating. You also have to be involved with the family. Mm-hmm. Um, if a mother is really addicted she would probably be the last one that you would want the baby to go home with, and in which case then treatment should probably be finished and in in, in, completed in the hospital. So it's, it's not just the baby that we're dealing with. We're dealing with what's going to happen after the baby mm-hmm. goes home. There are some programs that are really good, and they may send the baby home in five days, but these are the <clears throat> programs when the, mother, the mothers are in intensive treatment, uh, outpatient treatment, and in in some programs, the babies are actually with the mother, and so they are treating both the mother and baby together. We and really haven't gotten to talking about the mothers yet. We've been talking about the baby. Right. Let's come back just for a moment and talk about how do you find out that the baby needs to be treated? Well, we use the, uh, the scoring system, which is uh, 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 used widely. They call the Finnegan scoring system, and you give a certain uh, score for uh, the high pitch cry for the baby being fussy, ir- uh, irritable, mm-hmm. uh, any abnormal reflexes, uh, the sneezing, the hiccuping, and the fast, uh, the fast uh, breathing. So we give a score for each one of those things. And if a score is a certain number, then the baby may- will need treatment. And if the score is coming down after you start treatment, then you decrease the amount of medication you're giving to the infant. So you can base your treatment based on all of that information. That's correct, yes. One of the issues that um, uh, we've learned recently is that uh, for mothers who are actually in treatment, say they're receiving methadone uh, because of their narcotic addiction, 
um, and they are actually actually getting medical care, prenatal care, and they visited the, the neonatal intensive care unit because they know their baby may end up there. They're taught the Finnegan score because they're taught this is what we're going to look for, and because they don't want their babies in the NICU, um, they will uh, tell the nurses different things about the baby, not the correct information. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so uh, many of them are going home with babies that should be in the NICU. Well, I want to continue that conversation a little bit more, but we're going to take a very short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the cause of the problem and why it has gotten so bad. opening your medicine cabinet. And welcome back to our program, Drug-Dependent Newborns. A big question is, why is this becoming such a huge problem? And ladies, I guess to really get into it, we're going to talk about the moms now because they are the originators of this problem, so to speak. Where are they getting these prescription drugs? How are they getting them? Some of them get them on the street. Um, they, you know, illegally, but many of them get them through legal prescriptions. They will have an accident uh, or even an operation, get pain medication. Um, get you know, hooked on it? And get hooked on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that, uh, because of uh, j the Joint Commission uh, regulating hospitals, uh, was concerned about not treating pain appropriately by physicians. Um, and in the 90s, they set standards around making sure that every patient is asked about their pain level. Uh, people are, you know, asked on a scale of one to ten, what's your pain? Well, you make a judgment of what that is. Based on that score, is you know you get a prescription. I mean, you're given pain medication. Mm -hmm. You leave the hospital with a pain medication, and um, and it's very easy. And once you know you're addicted, you're going to want your body needs the medication, and so they will seek it through legal methods from a doctor who may continue to prescribe. Or unfortunately, here in Florida, we've had an epidemic of what we call pill mills where doctors just prescribe medication. Someone comes in with an, an MRI, they're required to bring that, right. um, and they're written a, a prescription for a large quantity of the medication. So we have these moms who are hooked on opiates, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, what treatment is available for them? Well, it depends. Unfortunately, there's not anywhere near enough treatment, and particularly, as Sherry mentioned earlier, treatment that involves the entire family. Mm -hmm. Um, at Operation PAR, where I work, we actually have a residential program designed specifically for women, and the women can bring um, their infant with them. Uh, if they're pregnant, you know, and they deliver, the baby comes immediately back, you know, once they're released from the NICU with the mom. And we have a holistic treatment with developmental services for the, the children of the mother. But that's rare. Um, you know, there aren't many programs in Florida or nationwide that actually have that capacity. And the, and the burden is increasing. Yes, the, it, it is. And with, um, and Henrietta mentioned earlier, uh, national health care and the, the need to cut costs. And, and so even in uh, their residential treatment programs are being cut, outpatient stays are shorter. 
Um, it's really difficult. And then we all know our, our country has a financial crisis sure. right now, and so That's the another, money is, is not available. Another <laughs> part to that. What are the mothers like to deal with who are addicted? <laughs> Well, they really range. You know, you, you do have the occasional mother who is um, appalled at the fact that she was told by either a methadone clinic or a well-intentioned uh, physician that this isn't going to affect your infant. Um, so you have very f few subset of mothers who end up there. Very often though, what I find in my unit, and I think they will agree, is that what you find is a woman who is addicted herself. And that, that causes a huge chasm in the ability to communicate between a nurse and the mother. You're teaching this woman who has an addiction problem, and, brain and changes. she has no capacity no to understand. And mm -hmm. it's you know it's an unfortunate cycle that we find these women in. We've talked about the babies and mm -hmm. the mothers. Are there fathers involved here? There are fathers involved. There, there are fathers mm -hmm. involved, but in I uh, mean, in the family unit, is there a family unit per se? It depends. It, it depends, it depends on but what we, you call yeah, we see a lot of moms where in the family unit there um, includes the grandparents actually and the mom right. and the father um, they are not, not the fathers involved. are not involved. Uh, so it's, it's really... The drug, drug use extended to the father perhaps or... That's correct, or mm -hmm. the father is in jail or the mother just got right. out of jail. Um, we really have a um, family unit that's not there. It's very dysfunctional. Mm. In, in most instances. So you're fighting on many levels. Right, which yeah. is Absolutely. one of the concerns, uh, as was, you know, we mentioned earlier, which is the difficulty in, in sending the baby home because we know the family situations without treatment are dysfunctional. We know that it's not going to be a stable environment. Um, and, you know, we, we talked earlier about, you know, long-term effects and what happens to babies, um, and it depends on many things. So, so how are social services involved in this? Well, in many cases, when the baby goes through, um, you know, the neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, there is a report made um, to protective services, um, protective investigations, who uh, come out and, you know, investigate, is this a safe environment? And they make determinations on whether it's a safe environment for the child to come home to. Um, and again, depending on where you are and what the state is and whatever, the Child Welfare Agency, here in Florida we have what we call community-based care. Uh, child welfare um, is not, it's, it's funded by the state, but it's a private entity that runs it. So there'll be a case manager involved with a family. Hopefully treatment will be part of the case plan, but there's the difficulty in getting mom to go to treatment, to get an assessment, to follow through. Um, and then the child may or may not end up in foster care, probably will end up, as Henrietta mentioned, with a grandmother mm -hmm. in relative care. But the grandmother, the mom is very likely living with a grandmother, and so oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's very Many, difficult. many layers. Yeah, wow. Absolutely. Well, social service agencies in one state have a close relationship with a very unique place. In the past two decades, they have spent and sent thousands of drug-dependent babies for care, but not to a hospital. The babies have gone to a unique newborn nursery. It's home until a baby can go home. We wanted it to look like a home and feel like a home because this is our baby's home. We wanted our families to be proud of where their child was. I'm passionate about the baby being treated with the utmost respect. I want them clean. I want them to nur be nurtured and loved at all times. And I want the parents to be treated with respect. The Pediatric Interim Care Center in Kent, Washington only cares for babies who were born dependent on drugs. Little Aiden came to pick when he was just 11 days old. Well, I was using heroin for the last two years of my life. In um, July, I, when I found out I was pregnant, I got on methadone and then relapsed in October. Um, 
ended up in jail for two months and then uh, went to uh, treatment, got put back on methadone, and he's here because he's withdrawing off methadone. Aiden was born full term at six pounds, 14 ounces, and 19 inches long. These are healthy babies, so unless they were going to have a problem other anyway, um, they're healthy. They're going through withdrawal, and um, once that's done, then they'll be okay. Babies like Aiden are why PIC exists. They're calm when they sleep, but overstimulation in some hospital settings can cause problems for them and others. If you have a rotating staff, it's really hard on them to care for a baby that's drug exposed because it takes a special talent, takes a lot of training. This is our specialty. The hospitals are overwhelmed with the number of babies. These babies are incorporated with the normal nursery. And a lot of times, you know, because of their withdrawals and their frantic behaviors, it can be very disturbing for the other babies. So uh, they offered to send them here. Since the program began in 1990, more than 2,700 babies have spent much of their first few weeks at PIC in specially designed rooms. They're in pastel colors because it's very calming for a baby that becomes overstimulated very quickly. So these colors are very soothing for them, again, because of the stimulus. Stimuli is their worst enemy. The babies going through withdrawals from opiates, um, if they're overstimulated, they need more medication. Um, they cry a lot more. They um, can't sleep in between. They don't eat as well. So having quiet, soft colors, it keeps the stimulus down. So they're able to relax better. Um, we don't have to go as high on medication um, because of that. So it's better for them all around. Aides take care of the hands-on things like feeding and diaper changing. Nurses handle the medical responsibilities. The babies withdrawing from opiates receive doses of morphine at set intervals. We give it every three hours. We're able to still see withdrawal symptoms. You don't want to get it so there's no symptoms. We want to see a little bit, but we want them to be comfortable. So it works real fast, probably 15, 20 minutes, and then it lasts for about three and a half hours. So just as we're ready to give it again, it's wearing off so we can see how they're doing. We base it on the baby, not on, we don't have set parameters where you have to go up this much or go down that much, and you don't have to do it in this so many days. We really listen to what the baby is saying to us. We watch their signs and their symptoms, um, how they're eating, how they're sleeping in between, and so um, we can go by that rather than just a set plan. So it's real individual to each baby and their needs. All of this care comes at a price but one far below what it would cost in a hospital. It's extremely expensive. You know, you're talking about health care costs of $100,000, $250,000 to take care of one of these babies, where, you know, here we can do it for a tenth or a twentieth of the, the kind of health care costs. So just from a dollars and cents point of view, it, it makes sense for these babies to be um, in the kind of facility that we are. Since the beginning, the Washington State Legislature has funded the Pediatric Interim Care Center. That money used to pay for most of the center's operations, but not anymore. Our budget is about half provided by that state contract, that state grant that we get from the legislature. And then the other half we raise privately through individual contributions and foundation grants and uh, just uh, in-kind donations. Everything in this building is donated either directly or indirectly. All our formula is donated, all our diapers are donated, all our baby shampoo, our powder, which we use a lot of for the methamphetamine babies. The clothes, I've never had to buy clothes for the babies in the 21 years we've been opened. Never had to buy formula. Everything has been donated. Much of the money goes to pay staff, something that may seem strange to some people. Well, I think what a lot of people don't understand in terms of why the, the kind of cost intensive part of this is that, you know, if you have a nonprofit that, you know, kind of has a daily staff, if you just have a daily shift, you have five shifts a week. But here we have to have staff on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's three shifts a day times seven days a week. That's 21 shifts a week. So, you know, it's a very in, um, salary intensive uh, proposition when you're taking care of a population that needs 24 hour care. 
that around-the-clock care is one of the reasons state social workers send babies to PIC. I think something that I really like about PIC is the babies stay there from, depending on, on the withdrawal process that they're going through, anywhere from three to six, sometimes eight weeks. And that really gives us, you know, it really gives me as a social worker an opportunity to see whether the parents are going to participate in services, are they actually going to go to the PIC facility and visit their baby? Uh, if they can't get there um, physically, are they going to call and check on how their baby's doing? Are they going to be participating in drug and alcohol treatment during the time that their baby is at PIC? Or if not, then it, it tells me that I it maybe need to be going to court and asking for a dependency petition to be filed. Historically, babies could only go to PIC if a state agency sent them there. But PIC is expanding to include a way for hospitals to refer babies directly, with parental consent. Everyone has to abide by the center's strict policies. We have a lot of rules um, for the safety of the babies. Visiting hours, they can't just come and go as they please. New mom Rachel takes a taxi from her treatment center to come see her son Aiden. I know he this is the best care facility around. Um, it's just a safe place for him to be while he's withdrawing. I hope that he um, is done withdrawing uh, and I will be in my six month treatment program and he can come straight to me there. There's a possibility of him going into foster care if that's what the court slash uh, TSHS department, CPS, what they all decide is the best for him. Um, but I will enter six month treatment no matter what um, because that's the only way I'm going to get him back. Until then, the staff at the Pediatric Interim Care Center will care for Aiden and others and enjoy some of the baby's milestone moments. For smiles and, um, you know, making cooing noises and just wanting to be up and looking around and you know recognizing people and it's a lot of fun especially when they get to be that little bit older. <laughs> you don't work here if you don't love the babies. I mean that's all we're about here is taking care of the babies and what's best for them. Everybody here just loves the babies. So ladies what do you think? Ready to bring it here if we can figure out how to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and they are working off of a lot of donation right this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult to get funding for um, babies who are drug dependent or programs like this because it's not a, a glamorous yeah. situation, uh, a glamorous cause. But they, um, but pregnant moms and babies are the way treatment programs like my agencies actually can fundraise. They are the only population of addicted clients for whom people will actually reach in their pocket and give us money. But I think the important thing from this is that um, the best time to probably reach um, a person who's addicted, the woman that's addicted, is at the time of, at birth I when they, she delivers. Mm -hmm. I because she sees that pretty baby yes. and something clicks in there mm -hmm. and she would say, I better change my life. And if we don't take that opportunity, yes. I think we would miss uh, that very important opportunity. I, I are, are you fighting a, a, an extreme battle because you're not only trying to talk with the drug that is in that person and trying to get through to them? Does that make it even more of an uphill climb? Well, yeah. I think it's an uphill climb, but I think that there, I agree with Henrietta, there is a moment in every one of these mothers' time that she has a period of lucidity. It's like, um, it's like a light bulb comes on when they look at their baby and they see that tiny life. And it's, if you can seize that moment, that I think is going mm -hmm. to be one of the tickets. We just need places for her to go. Mm -hmm. We have started here in Pinellas County um, through funding from our Juvenile Welfare Board a program to do exactly this. Um, I actually have staff uh, who are connected to the neonatal intensive care mm -hmm. units and when uh, a baby uh, who's uh, in a neonatal abstinence syndrome comes into the unit, um, they talk to the mom about giving my staff a call and they come and talk to the mom and we're providing, I mean the intent of what we're doing is to get the mom into treatment. Right. 
but we don't start there with the mom. We start with the mom and her baby, mm -hmm. and we're providing a, a parenting program for the mom called Nurturing Parenting, which talks about the skills mm -hmm. and what the mom needs to be able to do when she brings her baby home. Are, are these mothers somewhat stereotyped when they come in? No, they're, they're all the range that these ladies discussed earlier, but the interesting thing we're finding is um, at least right now, over 80% of the moms want to be involved with my staff. They're, they're eager for the parenting. We're doing in-home parenting uh, mm -hmm. with them, and we've already gotten some mom into, moms into treatment, into outpatient services. So, um, you know, we want to work on that period after birth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before she might get pregnant again mm -hmm. to get her off sure. of uh, oh, whatever yeah. she's taking. And, I mean, we're, we're early into this. It's only in the fifth month, but it's really exciting. Yes. Sherry, how do you keep your staff from being somewhat judgmental and plus the burden on them of having this and seeing this take place? That is a challenge. And, um, you know, nurses go into the neonatal intensive care unit because they love babies and they love to take care of that family unit. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is geared towards taking care of that. And what I have found is um, that answer is a myriad of um, trying to figure out what works best for that particular nurse. And we do have to have lots of support. We actually had um, people come in. We had outside people come in to do intensive counseling and almost like a trauma debriefing with our staff and we're tr we're getting ready to do that again because the numbers have just astronomically increased because one of the things that was said this is a hundred percent preventable it is and it's emotionally draining on the care mm -hmm. provider mm -hmm. it's you know you're caring for three the most i will allow my staff to take care of at one time is three nas infants and when you're doing the dynamic, that Finnegan scoring that Henrietta was talking about earlier, that is a dynamic tool that you score from the minute you finish at one score to the time you give that med the next time. So they're literally looking at three infants in three separate areas constantly scoring to keep up with the needs of those babies. And that burden has got to be pretty it is, heavy. It's an, it's it's an awesome emotional, emotional burden. And I have literally watched a nurse, and I don't think she would mind me sharing this, but she was working a 12-hour shift, and I saw her earlier on, and she was doing fine. And deep into the shift, we had several babies in one area that were all NAS infants. And I looked up, they were all crying, and I was lifting one up to cuddle that one and looked at her and said, can I do something for you? Honestly, she spun around and looked right through me. Just her eyes were glassy. It was a it was a traumatic event for her mm -hmm. to do her job. Right, right. right. and that is and one of the sad. issues is that the normal things that nurses do for babies in the neonatal intensive care units for comfort doesn't always work with these babies, and so the nurses are frustrated because what they know doesn't work. And they have to learn a whole new technique. And yes, there's anger. Yes. And now there's more than one. There's more than two mm -hmm. and three. There's a lot yeah. to deal with. One of the things that you know that has happened here in Pinellas County because our numbers have skyrocketed is that we have the addiction programs working closely with the neonatal intensive care and doing cross training. So we understand their needs and they understand the addiction process mm -hmm. and what's happening and and why the moms are the way they are mm -hmm. and. You know, I have my staff, I mean, I've told the nurses um, and the social workers, when you see a mom who comes in and she's clearly under the influence, mm -hmm. I mean, she's falling asleep, you need right. to call my staff because, yes, they may be in methadone treatment, but their dose is too high. Mm -hmm. So, Do you have that in your unit? Do you have the ability to call a social worker? We have that we, as we well. Have, we have uh, three social workers in our unit that we call um, to talk to so the families. Kind of lifelines for you? Mm -hmm. Well, not so much lifeline. I think mm -hmm. our nurses are the ones just, just they just take care okay. of these babies the best way they can. And you, the neonatal intensive care unit is really very, very different. And it's not really the place for these babies because what we have are 
in most nurse in the NICU, you have very sick babies, and you give a certain do a certain kind of procedure, and they magically get better. Okay, right. so everybody is happy. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is mm -hmm. really where I get all my adrenaline and see all these babies right. getting better. But the babies with uh, NAS, it takes a lot of your energy and your emotion to even just pacify them, to just calm them down. Let and me ask different. the big question here. How do we prevent from having the next NAS baby? What needs to be done? Well, it has to start from uh, prevention, from the women and the population as a whole, and um, preventing them and educating the young, one, the young generation about the problems with uh, drug use and what opiates can do to, you, to your brain and to your life. Uh, and we have to, to, to really start with that because preventing NAS, we're just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. We uh, are missing we what's, happened, what's happened before. So then. you believe this problem is much, much bigger than we actually know? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we need to um, have all of our doctors educated. Mm -hmm. and there need to be standard protocols at every obstetrician's office that every mother is screened. Uh, because right now, some doctors do it, some don't, so moms won't go to the doctors that are going to screen. So do the, do the doctors play a role here, or should they, more than they are? Right. Um, they should, and, right. and we have um, you know, doctors working on that right here within our uh, obstetric uh, or statewide obstetric organization to, to mm -hmm. survey right now, to survey the doctors about do they screen, do they prescribe prescription mm -hmm. meds to their pregnant women? Are they um, aware? If, uh, you know, yeah. if, if they do, what kind of prescription do they give? Do they give just a few days or do they give a 30-day supply? Um, and questions like that for an awareness mm -hmm. and just for us to get the data. Uh, but the doctors that are working on this really want a universal screening. I mean, they want the women drug tested, urine drug tested. They want them to ask questions everywhere. Um, and then they want the connection to treatment so that if they, you know, I ask Sherry, I'm the doctor, and she answers or I have suspicions that mm -hmm. I can get someone into Operation PAR or other treatment programs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be a big task, but there's really intense effort right now in Florida to do that and also work with neonatologists and pediatricians uh, and for because pediatricians carry young people up until they're in their teens to start doing that education at, well, at their level yeah, as well. It, it should really be the drug quote, screening it should be really part of any uh, health care prevention. Uh, when you see teenagers, ask them about drugs. Are they exposed to drugs and what do they do about it? And you start counseling from then on mm -hmm. and not wait until they get pregnant because if they get pregnant and you find out they're already addicted, mm -hmm. it may be too late. There's well, let me ask a question about that. Can a mom who finds out she's, she's been abusing a drug and she's <coughs> pregnant five, six months, can she just stop? What depends on the drug. Yeah. Depends on but let's say that she's on some sort of uh, she's Oxycontin okay, or something. She, if she's, if she's on an opiate, she the standard of care is methadone. Yeah. So do not stop. The answer right. is no. You the cannot just no. stop. Because of right. the transfer of that to the baby. Right. Well, it's because of the dangers to the mother as right. well. And okay. the baby. And the baby. Mm -hmm. Because the mother will go into withdrawal mm -hmm. if she just stops. The baby it will go into withdrawal. withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, the uterus is a muscle, mm -hmm. the muscle contracts, it can start delivery, mm -hmm. um, and it can be a preterm birth, and so, so there's, there's many complications many from doing complications. that. The, the advantage of going to a methadone program is, um, is really multiple. Um, one is to have a steady amount of opiate in that mother right. um, and the, the appropriate amount for her pregnancy, and then as a neonatologist, we would know that the mother was in treatment, and then we would know how to watch for signs mm -hmm. and symptoms and treat the baby. The other thing is women who are addicted uh, will resort to other measures that's illegal and so that addiction still stays in that, some that's form. That's right. And she will go to, you know, go into prostitution and to get the drugs that she needs. So mm. if she is at least in the methadone program, we take care of those other things that may also harm the baby that, that she's doing. You still have an opportunity and, and, for yes. control. And many methadone clinics, not all, do more than just give a dose of methadone. They provide 
treatment as well, the mm -hmm. counseling yeah. services so that go along drug, with yeah. it and develop a, a treatment plan that will involve the family and the, mm -hmm. the obstetrician and, and, and so on. So. We're running quickly out of time, but I, <laughs> I want to get back to the babies. What do we know long-term, long-term effects to these children that have been born with this? Very little. Uh, there have been some studies in the years ago from uh, um, on babies born to heroin using mothers or mothers who have been on methadone programs and um, So this is back to heroin not necessarily with the uh, not, not not the uh, prescription uh, and the pain level of and so uh, babies who were exposed to methadone or uh, heroin and they found maybe um, for the most part they're they're functioning normally may have a little bit of behavior uh, problems um, but we cannot really generalize the results of those studies because the number, the, the number of children followed uh, um, was small. Um, and they were probably just using heroin or methadone. And you know, as we spoke earlier, they're polydrug poly 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 drug users Absolutely. now. Are, are we talking about, is there any deformities with the children? Or are they mostly looking normal? Mostly, they're mostly looking they normal, look normal. And uh, they um, may just be smaller than your average uh, term baby if they were born at term. Uh, they may have complications that may be associated with prematurity if these babies were born premature. Born premature. Uh, but for the most part, they look physically, I should say physically, normal. They're just not the quiet nice babies. They're so it, it could take what, 20, 30 days before they are maybe released from, from care? Um, it, that varies depending on the infant. We, about 80 percent of our infants in my program um, are released within 19 days. Mm -hmm. They finish their treatment within 19 days. Um, the other 20 percent, depending on what was going on with mom and the way the baby's made up, could stay as long, we've had stays as long as 150 days in the NICU. And those were unique complications. Those were that unique went with complications, that. but going back to how do you how do you stop this? One of the things is we we need to talk about it. We need we need to get the word out, particularly in the obstetrical community right now. I think some of them are in denial that the problem is as rampant as it is. And we need to be, make it okay to Are we question as a, a pregnant a little, mother. Yeah, it's we a don't stigma. Want to it. I yeah. mean, there's a stigma with drug addiction. There's there's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. We all know that. I mean, when you think about when I say an addict, there's a picture that's in your mind right now, and it's probably not what not I, we mom. look like we, sitting no, here. No, it's right. not a pregnant mom. And that's no. that's really becoming less the picture of an addict. All right. They look like us. Yeah, they mm -hmm. they look like any woman. Any, any woman, woman, right? It's America. not just those women. <laughs> so where are we where are we failing to get the word out? What can we do? What would you say we need to do? Well, um, some a program like this would mm -hmm. make uh, hopefully would make a lot of people or everyone aware that this is happening, um, and really. It's really more education of physicians, healthcare providers, yes. and uh, folks in the in the addiction field, and even in in schools. We have to tell say, them. In, we in have to tell folks and, what yes. what's really happening. That right. this is a, a major yes. problem. You know, we have campaign campaign against smoking, alcohol. We mm -hmm. need to have a really uh, extensive campaign against prescription. Uh, painkillers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sherry, I understand you're working on some sort of a toolkit to use? We are. We're working with the Tennessee Initiative for Perinatal Quality Care, which is an organization in the state of Tennessee that pulls together NICUs from across the state. And we are one of three centers that are piloting a toolkit, which just tries to look out there at all the evidence that's out there and there's really not a lot. There's a dearth of evidence out there, meaning there's not a lot at all. But what we're trying to do is put together what we are finding success with and we are finding some success with the algorithm that we use and with the um, approach that we're using with the staff. 
also the environmental approach. So we are probably going to be ro rolling that toolkit out later this year, and it will be something that the TIPQC is the name for short for the initiative I'm talking about, but we will be rolling it out to all of the neonatal intensive care units in the state of Tennessee. One of the things that we're doing in Florida to follow up mm -hmm. is uh, Florida started um, actually about eight to ten years ago uh, establishing community drug prevention coalitions in every county mm -hmm. and the coalitions as long, along with the substance abuse providers are working together to get education. One of our counties here in Florida started a campaign called Safe Rx, Safe Prescribing. Mm -hmm. Um, they started, they've developed a lot of materials, they've done trainings with doctors, hospital personnel, mm -hmm. um, just professionals in the community, pharmacists, about prescribing practices, what's safe, how do you monitor, right. um, and it's going statewide. A lot of the other counties are picking it up, and so it, it really is an education process, and it's got to involve everyone. It can't right. be the police's job to right. shut, shut down the mm -hmm. clinics. I mean, we have to change. Yeah. In our case, we've we've instituted some thinking. some uh, legislation mm -hmm. about where pain clinics can be cited and how many prescriptions they can have mm -hmm. and, and, you know, those kinds yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. We have the Kentucky Perinatal mm -hmm. Association that's also uh, look, um, actually the two things that we are working on is really to decrease the rate of prematurity in the state mm -hmm. and also uh, drug use, substance use during pregnancy. So our conference, like once a year, we would have conference on related to these topics. And we primarily send out the word to uh, healthcare providers, nursing, uh, doctors, uh, physical therapists, everybody else who's involved in the in the healthcare, just make people aware that this is a problem, and we all have to work together to solve this problem. Well, I think you've given us the key. It is a big problem, and we all need to work together on this. And yes. we've already just finished our hour talking about this. It's going by very fast, and we have just really just scratched the surface of the right. issue of drug dependent newborns, but. We are out of time, and we want to leave you with some resources that may help you learn more to spread the word about this issue.